the seminar. It helps us helps us um, to learn and prepare for the remaining events. Um, the registration period was for five sessions, so you might not have the next week's session in your calendar, so please en enter it manually, but we have been reassured that the same link will work as every week uh, to join the session, the final session next week. Uh, back to you, Vesilius. Um, thank you, Ria, and the recording has just started. I mean, the first presentation today is by, will be delivered by Monica Kinuya and Halkano Bukuna de Fata. Um, both speakers are involved with the uh, Children Peace Initiative in, in Kenya. And the, the emphasis of the presentation would be on uh, integrated children in um, inter-ethnic conflict transformation. Um, so, um, Monica, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and good evening. I know we are coming from different parts of the globe. So good evening, good morning, good afternoon, all time zones incorporated and right there. And just checking, am I audible? We can hear you, we, we cannot see you, but that, that, that's fine if you choose not to use your camera. Yes, I'm, I'm in the bush and the network is not very strong. So Great. I think it's easier to hear than to see or losing both. Excellent. All right. So, so Hirari and I, we are founders of an organization called Children Peace Initiative Kenya. And we focus on children who have been in the conflict zone for a particular period of time or for better part of their childhood. And when we were asked to talk about child soldiers in Africa, we were like, wow, we have to get the correlation between our work and the children in conflict and what we do to try to make the situation better. And we are looking forward into inviting the, the audience, the scholars, the professors, the practitioners to hear the, how they can add value or how they can replicate what is going on here in Kenya in terms of looking for solutions into making situations better in different parts of the world who are experiencing conflict, which is directly involving children. I'm not sure that I have permission to share the screen, but that's what I would like to do now. I hope I'm able to do that. Um, in a few minutes, we should be able to see the screen. Good, great. All right, should be, should be right there. Okay, right there, there we are. So we are talking about child soldiers and I want to start by sharing a definition of who is a child soldier. We may have different experiences working with children in different situation or understanding of children soldiers in different locations, but the definition Hirari and I are going to use today is that a child soldier is any boy or girl who is below the age of 18. So that is a minor who is recruited or forcibly or joining by choice, recruited by any armed group in any capacity. And when we talk of any capacity, we are acknowledging that the child doesn't have to be on the war front. They don't have to hold the guns, but they may be serving as messengers, as cooks, as sex slaves for the warriors and for the soldiers. All these that should not be happening to this child whether they are directly or indirectly holding the gun or going to the war front, these are the categories we are looking at here as child soldiers. Sad enough, these are kind of scaring facts that globally we have over 250 child soldiers and 250,000 child soldiers. And unfortunately, 40% of these child soldiers are girls. And these are the ones who are mostly sexually abused and they are used as cooks to the slaves. They are used as spies in different capacities. Child soldiers are mostly common in Africa and Middle East. So we have several countries, we have DRC, we have Congo, we have Afghanistan, we have Yemen and Syria. We also have Uganda, I'm not sure whether right now you're going to have faced off all the child soldiers, but by 2012, the numbers were really high. And all these are the countries that have been put on the list of the countries that have had child soldiers. There's a lot of effort by the government.
to see how they can clear off the child, the engagement of children as soldiers, but still there's a lot of work that needs to be done. One may be wondering, like, why do children become soldiers? What would make the children go to the war front? Is it by choice? Is it by force? And what are kind of situations that these children find themselves in to, to join these kind of armed groups? Poverty is one of the forces or the drivers that make children join the forces. They are rewarded with money by the armed groups. They are rewarded with goodies. Some are even rewarded with drugs. And at the end, they find themselves becoming child soldiers. When most of these targeted children, they come from families which are seriously poverty stricken, making them more prime candidates for selection because they feel if I join the military group, my mom or my siblings will get a better life. Let me sacrifice myself. Then there is also the influence of other children who are already joining that makes these other kids think I can also join. There is the pressure and the privileges that comes along by feeling like you, you are on top of the world, holding the gun, all these factors and many others. Other children, they feel I'm going out there to protect my family. Unfortunately, the bigger percentage of the children who are recruited to join the military groups are forced, they are abducted, some are even threatened, and out of fear they joined all the armed groups, and some are even manipulated. Some are even put more to, they, are, they get scared because they are told if you don't come, we are going to do A, B, C, D to your family members, and they end up joining. Unfortunately, when the children joined the armed groups, some are forced to kill their own family members, their own neighbors, and they become outcasts, as we see towards the end. Even if they would want to come back, it becomes a little bit of very difficult for them to be accepted back into the community because of what they did when they were child soldiers. The images we are looking at repre represent a, a percentage or a portion of what most countries with child soldiers look like. Maybe some people are wondering, how does a child soldier look like? This is how an, an image of children soldiers. They are armed, they are very young, innocent and naive, but put through a process that makes them do things no one can imagine. And we keep telling the kids, a gun in the hands of a minor is a very dangerous tool because you don't just use it. It's not like a spoon you use for feeding. It can take away life, it can threaten life, and it can harm people who are innocent civilians who don't deserve the kind of treatment that comes along with holding a gun. So it is sad to see these kind of images all over, mostly among the pastoralist communities in different parts of the world and different countries in Africa and Middle East. So why are children used as soldiers? Number one, they are very easy to manipulate. Remember they are children. We keep saying children are tabula lasa. They are very open-minded either for positive or negative inference. So they become very easier targets for conflict and war. Children are also very emotionally and mentally immature. So you can take advantage of that weakness and put them on the war front. Children also have very little sense of danger. So you, they don't know the danger that is you are in them when they are holding the gun, when you are taking them into the mission. They don't question much. They'll just follow instructions as given, and that makes them prime candidates for recruitment. They are also cheaper source of labor in the sense that they don't eat a lot of food, so they will not require a lot of feeding like adults. They will also not require a lot of remuneration, and they will also not require a lot of training because they are not as stubborn as adults. However, the children soldiers need to be reintegrated at one point, whether for poverty reasons or for income generating reasons or for being coerced, it is important to note that it is against international humanitarian law to recruit children as child soldiers. Children need to be children. So reintegration programs comes in handy to help children who have been in the war front or who have been recruited as child soldiers. They need to be taken through the counseling to help them deal with the trauma, they need to be taken through kind of a cleansing process to help them think straight and become normal human beings. 
because the process they go through, the experiences they go through are not normal. Unfortunately, although integration programs come in to help, these children, they usually face a lot of rejection from their families because of the things they did before where, when they were joining the forces. They also become prime suspect for sus prime suspect. Like, are they here for good or they are coming to as messengers? So people are not sure whether we bring them in, do we take them in, or do we just leave them alone? Also, both the returnee and their families, they go through a lot of trauma because of the whole experience of being on the war front, of the killings they experience, and of life as a child soldier itself. All said and done, these communities, they need support to care for their returnee, and they need support also to to survive as normal, to get back to normalcy, the reintegration process. How do they become children again who can survive as children and grow? How do they fit in the community? All these are questions that comes along when we talk of reintegration. My colleague and I at Children Peace Initiative Kenya, today we want to mention briefly about a different or a new form of child soldier, a form that is not yet fully recognized by the UN, but it is happening. And these are the soldiers of, these are the children who are hard boys. They take care of animals, animals belonging to their families, but they are armed with guns to protect themselves and to protect their animals. I'm going to invite my colleague to take us through. Hilary, you're welcome. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Monica. Uh, what Monica has been addressing so far is conventional child soldiers as defined by the UN, by the UN and different uh, government. Our involving children in peace building, which we are going to, to share, came as a result of what we experienced in Kenya and most East African countries where uh, pastoralist communities live and fight from time to time. Among the pastoralist communities, children are systematically recruited as community child soldiers. You know, a child grows up and then is, he, he start herding like small shots or, or, or heifers and then graduates into maybe at 12 years, graduates into becoming like, like herding the cows. And at that point, the family buys this child a gun to protect, the, the, the intention is to protect the, the, the family livestock family properties, but they also use these guns to go and raid other communities, other communities. So we have, we have in, in Africa and especially in East Africa, where the pastoral communities live, uh, boys disguised as herders, but armed with sophisticated weapons. Sometimes they even go out of their way to ambush vehicles on the road, kill people, steal, and, and their children, they are, they are under 18, under 18 years. But this group of children are not fully recognized as, as, uh, as, child, as child soldiers. And as, as we contribute to this discussion, we, we would like uh, the scholars, the, the, the peace practitioners and, and the UN, you know, how can we deal with children who come through communities, who come through families and are armed? And in the process, they become um, child soldiers. They drop out of school. Some of them never go to school. You know, they, they, they are trained from childhood to use arms and, and to fight. This is the challenge we are dealing with and the challenge that made us to start this organization and work with children to bring peace between warring, warring, uh, warring pastoral communities. And, and what, we, what we do, we use the same energy that the people who recruit children for war use to use to, to work with them on peace. Children are easy to mobilize. They can easily become friends. So what we do, we make children from two communities who are fighting, we make them friends. And through them, we make their families, their warriors, their elders, uh, we friend by, by changing relationship between communities using children. So at, at, this, is, this is the discussion that we are, give, we, we are bringing to this, uh, to this forum that uh, even communities 
not only rebel groups, even communities, especially in Africa, the pastoral communities are recruiting children to be child soldiers to protect the community, to protect, to protect the family. But the children can be, but the energy of the children can be used in the same way to reconcile communities, to make, to make communities friend. This is the strategy we are using to make children who go to school, finish school and avoid joining, uh, joining community, community um, armed groups or avoid joining community warriors. This is, we, and, and, and those who are already in school, we try to maintain them in school so that they, they don't go out and join these uh, child soldiers in the name of uh, community herders and, and community war warriors. So uh, for us, we would, like, we, we would like to bring this challenge to the attention of scholars and the UN that the children who are disguised as hearts boys are armed, they are causing a lot of untold suffering in some parts of Africa. And we need to study and see how this challenge can be brought to the attention of the UN, of the, of the peace practitioners, peace scholars, to see a, the solution that can be brought. Thank you. And, and as we look at the issue of these children we are talking about, children who are armed, children who should be in school, but they are in the bush with guns, taking care of family cattle, taking care of family property. So they are not there illegally. They have been given this mandate by their own parents. They have been given this mandate by their own communities. Yet, in the, des in the description of children, they should be led to be children. So this group should be considered as child soldiers and possible solutions should be, should be sought. Probably if organized groups can come together and say what is happening need to be given a name and the name are these are children soldiers endorsed by communities. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Monica and Hilary. I was an excellent and very incredibly useful uh, presentation. Um, Hilary, can you please uh, stop sharing the... Um, the presentation so we can we can see the panelists um there are a few questions that we'll be discussing uh, later on but please please allow me to ask uh, an urgent di direct question now uh, for you to answer and then we'll have the opportunity to, to discuss this further um we have a question from uh, Shiori takawa um asking if you have ever faced any challenges and difficulties uh, with regards to reintegration uh, of, of children to their communities, such as re rejection from the host communities or even parents um, in, in this process. Monica, we can, oh, good. Thank you so much. Uh, we, we have done the, our program in Uganda and Uganda is one of the countries who have gone through child soldier through the RRA, RRA means RRA. RRA. And a lot of children, especially in Northern Uganda, went through the recruitment process as child soldiers. And we talked to families and they were sharing how scared they were to receive. At one point as a mother, you have the love of a child, you want the child back, but you're also scared because of the decision of the community. The children are seen as outcasts because maybe people already know so-and-so killed our neighbor, but they did that under duress. They were forced to do that. And they were children immature and ignorant of many things. So these are the dilemmas that have called for mediation and dialogue to see how both the people who are hurt and the victims and the perpetrators can be brought to the table to see how do we now move forward? What happened happened? How do we amend the situation how do we make things better? Is it an apology and move on? Is there anything else that can be done? So such kind of scenarios. But yes, many families experience rejection and experience these kind of experiences because of the complicated relationship between the Thanks. parties. So much, Monica. I'm also mindful of, of, of the time. So we'll have the opportunity to discuss uh, more questions towards the end of the session. Uh, I should now pass into my co-host, uh, Ria. Thank you so much. Um, Nora's uh, just, uh, oh yeah, she's back. 
So it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Knorr Berry from Protestant University of Applied Sciences in Bochum, in Germany, uh, who will take us through her presentation on exploring the gender-related impact of war and political conflict based on the example of children born of wartime rapes. Uh, thank you very much, Ria. Thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to speak today on this important topic of social work. Um, first of all, one, two for, um, thoughts. Uh, the globalization of armed conflict and the internalization of um, social work have made uh, these issues of international conflict and their human consequences a silent topic, confronting social work with new uh, political and practical problems. And uh, conflicts and war produce vulnerable groups uh, whose bodies are injured and killed like children and women and refugees and displaced people. And my uh, input deals with the consequences of uh, mass rape and sexual violence, which are still part of war strategies. And uh, these mothers and their children born from such brutal attacks experience uh, psychosocial burdens such as social exclusion and stigma. And uh, this topic brings up a painful subject. Uh, these forms of violence should not be reduced to a break in civilization, but must be preserved as a continuity of violence in society. And I remember that last week the question was being raised about the relationship between war and peace, which peace for whom. And uh, for only normative gender orders that already exist, um, prepare the ground for the legitimation of sexual violence in the context of war and are to read in the sense of a continuity of existing conditions and violence in the society. And uh, for me, the cause for dealing with children born of wartime rapes were the Yazidi women who fell victim to ISIS crimes and bought children as a result of sexualized violence in war. The existence of these children has raised human rights and ethical normative questions. And now I want to share with you a small presentation. Um, maybe it's then easier to follow the thought. Can you see it? Okay. Um, my contribution is divided in these uh, four points, uh, topics. Uh, first of all, the prevalence and the definitions, and then some explanations, approaches, to wartime rape and analysis of the consequences, the effect for the mother's children and transgenerational effects, and um, at last, uh, the conclusions for psychosocial interventions. Could you just please start at the presentation mode? Excuse me? Uh, could you start the presentation mode? Because at the moment, we're just seeing it as um, regular. What? It's not showing in presentation mode. You, you can't see, the, you can't see my presentation. I don't know, we can, but it's just, it's, um, if you uh, need to start the presentation mode, at the moment we are seeing the whole program. Um, ah, okay, I understand. Okay, I try again. Excuse me. I think someone helpfully suggested just pressing F5 on uh, um, uh, Windows-based computers. Yes, the question is then of, if I can see my... Uh, Ah, don't worry, don't worry, because it was visible. Okay, okay. So I try again. Okay. What can you see now? Um, can you it see the presentation? Yeah, yeah we, mm -hmm. yeah, we can see fine now. Thank you. Uh, you can see the presentation and my notes? Um, no, it's, it's fine as it is. It's fine. It's fine? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You can you can uh, tell me if um, it's not okay for you. Thank you. Okay. So um, you see now the, the the next slide with the prevalence. Yes. Yeah, it's okay. So um, about the prevalence, uh, maybe it's important to to say that this mass rapes and sexual violence uh, continue as a part of the broader strategy of conflict and war, and uh, that they always have been documented for past and present wars. And in Germany, um, the in, moment, stop, excuse me. Okay, I don't know, but I just continue. <laughs> okay. 
And in, in uh, Germany, uh, the invasion of the Red Army and the end of the Second World War caused an estimated 1. million rapes. And in the European Community Fact Finding uh, Mission, a uh, team estimated that more than 20,000 Muslim women were raped during the war in Bosnia, and 500,000 women were systematically raped during the genocide in Rwanda in 1994. The self proclaimed warriors of the ISIS um, uses the uh, valuation of women as a tool of gathered and implemented a deeply rooted system of sex slavery. And Yazidi girls and women survived the genocide and were freed by the, uh, um, freed by, they became pregnant. And um, in recent days, there has been news that evidence has been found of Ukrainian women being raped by invading soldiers. And uh, when we say at the, um, the numbers, the precise numbers, it's impossible to, to uh, say the determ and determine the precise numbers. Official statistics compromise only the tip of the iceberg of gender-based violence. And with regard of a wartime rape, um, the estimated number of unreported cases is likely to be uh, even higher. Even if persons concerned want to report, this often fails because of a lack of uh, the structures of registration, in addition of tabooing and registration, uh, cause the consequences of what visibility uh, play a role, depending on the culture of the war context. Is visibility given, for example, of the biological origin, uh, as in the case of GIs in Vietnam, via their eye shape or the Afro-Americans after the Second World War in Germany, via the skin color? Is visibility given in the cultural context because um, an unmarried woman gives birth uh, to an illegitimate uh, child, uh, illeg illegitimate child, and so it's not so easy to to um, to say something about the real numbers. And when we have a look on the definitions and classifications of the target group, there are different definitions. This is one from Moffman. She uh, classifies four different categories and uh, and differs between the children of enemy soldiers and local women, children of soldiers from occupation forces and children of child soldiers and children of UN peacekeeping forces. And uh, in, now I will... Um, just follow or concentrate of the first category, the children born, born of wartime rape. Uh, there is a definition for, for this, and uh, important is that wartime rape is uh, related with conflict-related sexual violence, is considered to be this form. And the characteristic for this, these are that the uh, perpetrators are often affiliated to a state or non-state armed group or a terrorist network. The victims are often actual or perceived members of a persecuted political, ethnic or religious minority. And there is a climate of uh, impunity. And um, maybe important that this, this um, sexual violence form conflict related is recognized as a war crime that is um, possible, that is um, preventable and punishable. This is important, that it's really a war crime. And so it's possible to punish it. And after the mass rapes in Rwanda and Bosnia and Herzegovina during the 90s, a wartime rape has been uh, codified as a method of warfare. And according to the UN Security Council, um, the rape and other forms of sexual violence can constitute a war crime, a crime against humanity, or a constitutive act with respect to genocide. And our, my topic or contribution is also a point to, um, to point out the gendered uh, aspects of this form of violence. And it's not so easy to say how, because there are some different um, uh, ways or to, to answer explanation and sex uh, self-explanatory thesis that this violence forms part of the nature of human being or of man according to the motto of um, it is wartime and therefore man will behave in this way because of man's bestial nature. It cannot be proven scientifically. Not all people rape in times of peace uh, or war. Not all women are affected by rape. Men are also raped by other men. And in some instances, even women orchestrate cases of sexualized violence against men or other women in war. And scientific analysis demonstrate that these acts of violence can only be explained multidimensionally and uh, for the reconstruction of gender dynamics of armed conflicts and political violence and for 
the young genocide through gendered lenses, these uh, different explanations uh, for sexual violence in war are discussed. First uh, of all, this that some authors contend that social cultural norms defining gender roles um, specifically rape, uh, war rape, especially patriarchal and religious values. And the second explanation, rape as a weapon of war, um, is that uh, wars are fought not only with guns, shells, tanks, or drones, but the female body is a battlefield as well, and this intimate method of warfare harms mentally and physically. Rape and mass rape is a war in war and uh, may be part of a military or political strategy in advance or retreat, and it's classified as a military strategy for troops to, to feel good. Um, the third explanation is masculinity as a root cause. Um, several authors argue with masculinity uh, to explain the patterns of male behavior. They argue that uh, at times of social political tension, prior to conflict as well as during conflict itself, some types of masculinity come to be celebrated and actively promoted to a greater degree than others. In some conflict situation, um, the more violent aspects of masculinity are played out in all aspects of men's life to an extreme degree, so-called heteronational masculinity. And the dimensions of masculinity in relation to national and male identities is important for imaged orders of nation stability and security. And this uh, type of identity, this heteronational male identity, are enforced and legitimized by means of the rape of women, their victimization, and the territorialization of their bodies as uh, war field. And the fourth uh, explanation is um, this, according to the UN group, this strong nexus between sexualized violence, trafficking, and terrorism. And uh, this can be uh, recently be observed. And in this process, radicalization and violent extremists uh, have contributed to the anchoring of discrimination, discriminating gender norms. Um, there, for uh, as I said before, there are multiple consequences for the mothers, the children, of course, for the society. And the sexual violence in, in wars have a diverse short-term and long-term individual and social consequences for the survivors, even though so violence uh, often occurs as my, my mass violence, the individual experiences and ways of coping which are different for mothers and children should be taken into consideration. Briefly, uh, the, con the consequences um, for the mothers can be mentioned as uh, multiple complex and long lasting impacts uh, for the life of the victims, their families and the communities and like unwanted pregnancy, sexual transmitted inf uh, infections like HIV and traumatization, stigma and discrimination as a common experience of the survivors and uh, mental um, disorders like anxiety, depression, PTSD. And um, for the children, uh, for this- Sorry. Hmm? Okay. Just two, two minutes. Sorry, just in terms okay, of time okay. keeping. Okay, I try, I try. Um, and for the children, if he, we have a look at the children, um, they are, uh, of course, a very, very vulnerable uh, group. Um, and they has in the community, they are, they are denoted with bad blood or political, ethnical, religious enemies. And this kid, these kids are already stigmatized at birth and suffer, um, suffer their whole life from these discrimination consequences. And um, one point, uh, maybe you see here this model uh, for analyzing um, is typical for, for um, these children is they, this uh, point of identity confusion, childhood uh, maltreatment and stigma discrimination. And because of the time, I just want to see um, one sentence to this identity aspect. Um, for these children, there are a lot of um, questions about their identity because um, they have a fatherlessness, a feeling of fatherlessness is not the same like like other children without father, because they are, they know nothing about their um, fathers. There's a, a fragment is missing with their identity, and some of them get information from their mothers. Others uh, take the other mothers take the secret to their graves. So um, they have no memories, no narratives, no ideas about their uh, their identity, and. Um, this otherlessness and this um, aspect of identity brings them to the ambivalence between hate and love to their fathers and uh, the relationship uh, also difficult to, to their mothers. 
And um, maybe the for the perspective aspect, um, it's interesting that this um, that they have no voice. They they um, they have uh, or other. My, my English is not so well to um, describe this, but it's interesting that in this context, this in the 25 years after, for example, in Bosnia, the children of um, what time uh, these children they have organized themselves and had now a voice. They have this network of um, victims, forgotten children of war, and uh, they discussing there and have a power and, and try to change. Maybe one example from Bosnia and also this example from Iraq, where um, this, uh, this is very complex because the children they have no I uh, identity cards and because of the law and just the children. Uh, because of also um, religious, also community, and also the because of the law, they have no uh, identity document documentation, and so they have no birth registration, and they are excluded from um, healthcare, from uh, education, from all possibilities and their human rights. And now, uh, the mothers um, of these children, they have this campaign with other NGOs. My name is my mother because. Uh, this should be a possibility for them uh, with the names of their mother they, that they get an ID, that they get an identification and uh, can participate to the society with all the possibilities. And But unfortunately, this is then since 28 and um, there is nothing done un until now. And last point, last, um, maybe just for conclusion, what I would um, suggest is when we analyze uh, and reflect its um, aspects for the children is to um, to see there also we have to also to the transnational and contextual perspectives of the wartime rape um, that we see their processes when we look to Bosnia to Iraq and that we don't forget the top Object oriented perspectives for the children and their mothers and not just to see them as victims of, of violence uh, and also see their, sub, uh, their own uh, view to, to them, their identity and to their future, and to be hopeful that sometimes uh, this process-oriented perspective and um, that there are changes in life uh, if they uh, get the possibility, so not just to be pessimistic in this, um, in this sense. So I stop the presentation, I think it was not so it, um, possible as I wanted to, but short form. <laughs> It was very rich. If you have a chance, do have a look at all the comments because people have been deeply, deeply moved and find this one of the most important, if not the most important presentations of our series. So it's a powerful day today. Um, just very briefly, one question. What are the roles for social workers locally? You mentioned the importance of transnational work, but for social workers working in contexts affected by political conflicts, what are their roles uh, with working with children born out of wartime rape? Right? Um, the experience came maybe from the experiences in, in Kurdistan, Iraq, and it, um, these children and also their mothers, they're excluded from society and also of the, from the community and they're living in the refugees camps, for example, because the, the community, some of the, even the religious authorities, they don't want them to come, to come back. They say our children or daughters are welcome, but not the children of the enemy. So it's very important to give a possibility for these mothers and their children because their children and need the relationship with their mothers that they feel uh, that uh, they are they are human beings and have right to exist this is the first mm -hmm. the first point and the second is to help that they can share and be part of the development processes like education healthcare so this, these practical points because this um, gives the possibility to uh, feel their rights to have changes because otherwise without without healthy possibilities without uh, trauma therapy without um, identity and all these aspects are excluded from society and there is one danger because these children if you don't um, you, you can't catch them and bond them to society and their mothers um, uh, they uh, this this um, violence they get <laughs> and feel it can be transgenerational transmitted so you can't put a problem of society just beside and think when I don't look at it, it is uh, then uh, I have not the problem. You have to deal with it, otherwise the next generation you have another problem and it's very easy for 
for terrorists and other groups to catch these children because they need this uh, feeling of belonging and acceptance and power. Mm. Thank you so much. I really hope that we have time at the end to revisit the transnational uh, elements that you so rightfully emphasize. But without further ado, uh, ado, I'm going to introduce our last speaker for today, last but not least, Dr. Raj Yadav, who is from the University of Sunshine Coast in Australia. Raj's name uh, may indicate that he's originally from Nepal and his presentation today is on decoloniality and social work in Nepal. So over to you, Raj. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I will say uh, good morning because, because I'm in Australia. And now at the moment, time is 3.19 a.m. I just woke up in a couple of hours ago. So I'm still in sleeping mode. Um, uh, I have you know, very simple clarification at the very beginning of my presentation. Uh, and you might, have, you might have seen my slide, you know, I'm a human discussing about social work from my limited knowledge and experience. Hence, all mistakes and ignorance are my own. Um, just going to my presentation about decoloniality in Nepali social work. Um, I'll be briefly discussing about how social work was introduced in the background of in, in the backdrop of Maoist insurgency and what it was supposed to be, and over a period of time, you know, what exactly social work has become in Nepali context, Nepali society, and how it can be fixed from my own personal perspective. Hence, um, the entire discussion in this presentation is about me. In other words, it's about you know my representation, my self representation in social work, and so many of you might feel you know it's a kind of you know my narcissist narcissist expression, or possibly you know, possibly my presentation is suffered from I miss syndrome. But what I'm what I'm trying to clarify here is you know this is not you know narcissist narcissist expression of mine. This is not, you know, this is not, you know, suffered from I miss syndrome. Rather, you know, this is a kind of, you know, a model good positionality from my side. What exactly social work in Nepal should be, and what is, how exactly social work in Nepal should emerge in in the future. So let me you know, uh, give you some idea about myself. Uh, this photograph is from you know, 2004. At the, you know, um, extreme, you know, on left hand side, that's me when, when I started my social work at, you know, undergrad. And that time I had recently graduated as a junior engineer and I did my, you know, a junior engineering, engineering you know, qualification from uh, in electrical engineering. And I thought as an engineer, I could not contribute to Nepali society. Rather, I should choose social work education and contribute to Nepali, ne Nepali society. I was highly uh, ambitious to become a social worker, thinking this social work is going to give me some knowledge, skills, tools, and technology to work with Nepali people, to work with my people, to, 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 to develop Nepali society in so many different ways. But guess what? Uh, over a period of time, I was wrong. I was completely wrong. The more I was trying to understand social work and its positionality in Nepali society, I found social work was not suiting, social work was not suitable in Nepali society for so many different reasons that I'll be discussing in later part of my presentation. This photograph is again, you know, um, this photograph is from uh, India when I was doing my master of social work uh, between 2008 and 2010. I thought maybe Nepali social work does not have sufficient idea to train Nepali young, young person so that he so that he can help Nepali society. And I was I was expecting if I'm going to get my education from India, it will help me to learn in better way about social work. But guess what? I was again proven wrong by social work in India. In, in India, what I learned was again something way, way, way different, which was not suitable for me. And then finally, I came to Australia to do my PhD in 2013. And that's, that, that was the time I started to research about decolonizing social work in Nepal. So this is my very, very brief background, my own journey in, in relation to social work. 
and what exactly I was thinking in the past and how, how, how I'm thinking about social work in the present. Um, if I have to explain more about Nepali social work, possibly I need to take you in 1990s. And in 1990s, social work was introduced in Nepal. Not only social work was introduced, for so many things, 1990s was you know, important for Nepali history. And the first thing was in 1990s, first time Nepal got multi-party democracy system. Before that, Nepal was ruled by absolute monarchical system. In the same decade, we had Maoist insurgency, inspired by Marxist Leninist and Mao Zedong philosophy, Maoist party has picked up arms and they had started to fight against Nepali government. And they fought for almost you know, a decade and because of their, their insurgency, almost 15,000 people, Nepali people, they lost their lives during that time. And it was the same time social work was introduced in Nepal specifically in 1996 as, as you know, Bachelor of Social Work Education. But I won't say, you know, introduction, rather I, I prefer to, I prefer to term it, you know, arrival of social work in Nepal. But the more accurate explanation would be importation of social work in Nepal. Um, some people, uh, including myself, and one of the scholars is Miku in, from Nepal, who writes from Nepal, and Myself, myself and Niku have, Niku have you know, described you know, our origin and history of social work in our previous works in terms of you know, chronological events or chronological events, you know, chronological events and also you know, in terms of you know, thematic analysis. Uh, if you read a Niku paper, which was published in 2011, he has described you know, how social work education has developed from one institution to so many institutions in Nepal. In my own work, I wanted to understand thematically how social work education has developed in Nepal over a period of time. So for example, you know, my classification is from between 1987 specifically, or 1996 to 2004, they, there was beginning phase of social work. Also, it can be said in a colonial route of social work education. 2005, between 2005 and 2010, popularization phase, and this is this is the time when social work education became so popular in Nepali state. And 2011 onwards, I would like to say period of disillusionment, questioning the leg legitimacy and direction of social work. But what is the main problem with, with the understanding of you know, social work in chronological order? The chronological order of social work is not giving us the critical insights. And that's where we have to engage as in you know, social work scholars and those who are concerned with, with, with social work um, in critical sense, we have to engage with critical history. Uh, Goswami and his colleague has discussed, you know, if we want to discuss about critical, critical history, if we want to engage with critical history, possibly we need to engage ourselves in moral and political standpoint. Also, we need to, we need to engage in Reasonable, reasonable dissatisfaction with the, with the historical events. And we should also see what are the attempts or you know, what are the reflections over a period of time in the history. And this is what is the main foundation of my presentation today. Um, from the moral and political standpoint of view, what I see social work is, social work in Nepali social work is something like you know, Western cuisine with Indian flavor, which means uh, we wanted to, Nepali social work is something like, you know, pasta, which was, you know, brought from, you know, abroad overseas Western country. But when it was, when they were making pasta, they also, you know, added some, you know, Indian spices. And this is exactly, I have shown in this, you know, uh, diagram. So if you see the history of Nepali social work, it roots is definitely in colonial imperial centers, like, you know, UK and USA. And then it was brought to India in 1936. And in 1996, with the help of Indian social workers, some of the American missionaries, they introduced social work in Nepal. Now, there are so many options for Nepali social work. At the moment, Nepali social work definitely suffers from you know, colonialism. It has an option to move from colonial, colonial social work to you know, something still, you know, uh, guided by you know, uh, imperial social work, in, in other words, the universal social work perspective. 
it also has some of the opportunity to transform social work in indigenized way. However, my positionality is for long period of time, Nepali social work should not be opting anything, anything you know, from you know, these options. Rather, Nepali social work should strive to achieve how it can decolonize itself in Nepal. So this is my moral and political standpoint, standpoint in terms of Nepali social work. Um, the second thing is, What are my reasonable dissatisfaction with Nepali social work? Given social work in Nepal is imported one, given social work in Nepal is colonial product, it has damaged Nepali social work in so many, so many ways. For instance, colonial social work has taken power away from Nepali social workers to decide what social work ought to be in Nepal. And hence, Unfortunately, there is no exact translation of social work in Nepali language. Unfortunately, I have to highlight this one. Until today, we don't have Nepali terminology, a Nepali word for social work. Likewise, colonial social work has promoted hegemonic epistemology and pedagogy, and thus it has resisted, resisted the homegrown perspectives to come, homegrown perspectives to come to the fore. We cannot think what social work can become from homegrown perspective. Uh, likewise, excessively inspired by the mainstream social work's ontology of person in environment, Nepali social work has been engaged in the ontology of self forgetting, and thus it has undermined and underassessed the collective nature of Nepali society. Until today, None of the social work education, none of the social work slaves and curriculum in Nepal has taken consideration of collective nature of Nepali society. But the reality is Nepali society is largely based on collectivity, collectivism. Um, likewise, from a technological point of view, it is far away to decide who its targets are and where exactly it fits into Nepali society. This way, the very sense of social in social work in Nepal is missing. We cannot justify what is social in Nepali social work. It has allowed lumping, lumping bourgeois to organize and run social work education, or in other words, run social work institutes, and thus it has promoted neoliberalism, neoliberalism in more recent times. And this relates to my um, uh, another dissatisfaction, and this is exactly, you know, uh, Except this is exactly in you know, the passage from my uh, PhD thesis, and I have published you know, books in books on the basis of my PhD thesis. And if you read this uh, passage carefully, what you'll find is, yes, social work was to some extent, you know, positively, it was contributing Nepali young people to come together. It was contributing for to Nepali young people to unite and think about how they can do services, how they can work for Nepali society in more organized way. But the problem was all those skills, knowledge, and ideas that social promoted was alien to Nepali young people. And the question would be, are Nepali social workers happy with this? My simple answer is no. People like me who is coming from Nepal, who has invested his time and efforts for Nepali social work, we're not happy with the kind of social work that we have. In fact, I will say, you know, the kind of social work that we have is colonizing our minds, colonizing the minds of young Nepalese people who cannot think what kind of social work will be suitable and relevant to Nepali people? What kind of social work will be relevant and suitable for the, from the future perspective of Nepali society? So this is one of the major dissatisfaction against social work, the social work which was imported to Nepal in 1996. So what can be done from a critical perspective, from a critical historical perspective, we should also reflect on, we should also propose the idea of what can be done to make social work more suitable to Nepali society. And this is, you know, one of the idea, yeah. uh, I'll finish it here. Yeah, and this is one of the idea, you know, which emerged from, you know, uh, my research, you know, if social work has to be decolonized, if social work has to be 
uh, redesigned from decolonial perspective. What we need to do is we need to focus on so many things. For example, we need to focus, we need to consider cultural you know, aspect of Nepali society. Likewise, we need to, we need to consider structural aspect of Nepali society and the developmental aspect of Nepali society. And likewise, you know, we should emphasize in the context. So this is all about, all about you know, my presentation. Um, if you have any questions, comments, or criticism uh, for my presentation, yeah, you're more, you're most, you're most welcome. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Raj. Do you mind just stopping the screen share, please? Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank you so much for interesting presentation. I want to start with a question, which I'll ask first of you, but it's actually for all of the presenters. In a context such as you so eloquently described, what do you think are still elements of not just building the practices which are relevant locally and which emerge from local context and local needs, but particularly in situations such as um, work with child soldiers that we heard about and children born of wartime rape, right, which don't just happen in one context, but in many uh, war con affected contexts across the globe. How do we then build from the ground up more international collaboration and exchange and joint work because a lot of comments um, that we are seeing is a call for social workers to be more engaged with each other and speaking up more internationally um, about these issues. Um, well, from my, my understanding, the way I have been, you know, uh, analyzing and observing the development of social work globally and internationally, you know, what I feel is, you know, are we we tend to talk you know, about you know, decolonization, but the true sense of decolonization is missing. The very idea of decolonization itself has become you know, so much so political one, where people are talking about decolonization, but in fact, they have vested interest, possibly in a very simple sense, you know, they want to have one more publication. And they want to represent you know, some organization at you know, global and international level, but the true solidarity with the others with capital O is missing there. And this is where we need to reflect social work scholars and researchers and those who are, you know, um, comrade of you know, decolonization, and they should reflect on themselves, you know. They should not, you know, put themselves in the, in the front line. Rather, they should think about their context. Rather, they should think about those people who have been oppressed and suppressed, you know, because of colonial social workers. And this is where we need to, you know, have, you know, a collective campaign possibly global and international campaign where we can come together and you know support and you know help those people you know who wants to you know uh, initiate and work for decolonizing social work in Nepal and possibly in other parts of the world you know so I believe you know we need to talk for you know our true sentiment we need to talk for you know a true solidarity in terms of you know decolonization. So building from the ground up with a kind of sense of solidarity and finding a new ways of collaborating with each other. I want to open the same question, if that's OK, to um, the rest of our participants, to, to presenters, to Monica and to Halkano and to Knutsunur. So do you have any said, as Knut, you mentioned at the end of your presentation, how the transnationality is an important part of um, the work that you do and that needs to be done. So do you have a sense kind of keeping in mind of all the trappings that Raj talks about how to do that? I think um, it's very in important and interesting to work uh, internationally for these questions because it's helpful to describing the phenomenon and to make it easier to, um, to observe what is uh, general and transnational and what is specific. And uh, it helps for the, the victims, for example, to have a stronger voice and to understand, for example, just for the example, Kurdistan, um, the and the, the Yazidi minority in Kurdistan, the minority in within a minority, and then the gender issues, and then the child. So you have this uh, aspect um, um, to to see, okay, this is not just something Kurdish people have no place for their identity, because then you have this. Um, uh, uh, this aspect to say, okay, in Rwanda, in in uh, in Germany, and other countries we have in Bosnia, you have the same topics in historical other situations, and you can learn from this aspect, and you can also describe and see there's something there's um, norms in the society, 
for example, the collective families, what also Radia says, the, the structure of the society, but also the laws, for example. And we have international laws. So you can, on the international um, level and on the local level, be more powerful for these questions, um, I think. Okay. Monica, I don't know whether you have anything to, to add. Would you kindly ask the question again? So in terms of how do we support more international collaboration on these important topics, which certainly seems required because it happens in so many contexts, while trying to avoid the trappings of colonialism, for lack of a better word, um, that Raj talks about, how to kind of rethink how we collaborate with each other on these important topics internationally. I think, I think there's a there's need for a lot of documentation because as, as we mentioned, these are voices less heard and a lot need to be done for them to be heard. So one, one key thing I would emphasize again and again is need for documentation and research so that the world can know what is happening and can think about it. And then we seem like we have conditioned our mind to think about, for example, child soldiers in a particular way. We need to broaden our thinking and see the bigger picture of what is not yet labeled and label it and look for a way forward. Again, there is also need for support. Unfortunately, this young organization trying to do great work on the ground may not have a lot of financial capacity to reach to as many families as possible. So support to this kind of organization, support to our organization would come in handy to see an impact on the ground and globally at the same time. Thank you. Thank you. And that seems to be an important issue. I think that because a lot of financing comes from international sources and that kind of comes with a lot of conditionality as to how and where and by whom that money can be spent. And on the other hand, it's really important to make these. And this is the, so special about the current series. It's all been organized by people who themselves come from the context that uh, 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 and have been personally affected by political conflict. So um, hopefully we can organize this more. But Vasilius, I'll ask, pass over to you because we maybe, have maybe a maybe few minutes. Maybe just a quick one, Ria, a yeah. quick one. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we received, I remember some eight, 10 years ago, we received funding from the Dutch government. Mm. And we journeyed with one corridor of conflict where children were all on arms. It was very dangerous even for locals to move around. We journeyed with them for five years. And eight years later, there is no single incident of a life lost due to violent conflict. People gradually put the guns down. Nobody told them to, but they did not see the need anymore. So as we say how powerful our initiative is, we want to also make it clear that these mm -hmm. things are doable. You don't need to tell people to put the guns down but you can connect the families in a way they don't feel afraid to protect themselves anymore. The children can go back to school and they can put the guns down. So we, we need support. We need people who can appreciate investing in work that need long-term long -term process, not just here and now. And we gradually we'll see visible changes. We'll save a life or two or 10 or 20. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Actually, there is another uh, very relevant question. I think it's, it's again more relevant to the first uh, couple of presentations with regards to um, the dilemma between retributive and restorative justice. And the question is, what should our profession's uh, approach be when it comes to dealing with child soldiers who have been found to have committed atrocities, you know, crimes during war, but they're still children? Uh, and, and likewise, what approach should we be following in this transition from uh, war to peace when dealing with people who committed um, the crime of, of, of rape? Should we follow uh, a retributive or a restorative or a transitional justice approach? I can start with, with Monica and then uh, Sinua uh, could follow. Uh, thank you so much for, for the great question right there. Uh, I'm pro-restorative because the harm has already happened. We need to move on. And even if we go to punitive, remember these are children. There are so many, the situation is very complex. So we need to factor many things, look at the situation and the scenario before we conclude that we can do punitive or retributive. Some are not doable. 
every case scenario is different. The situation in Kenya may be very different from the situation in Uganda, situation in Yemen, in Ukraine, every country has its own dynamics and depending on the type of scenario and the situation and conditions that made the children find themselves where they did is different. But all said and done, it's always going to encourage a restorative because we are human beings, we make mistakes and people need to move on. This may not sound very good for the people who, for the victims, but eventually we need to look for how can the community heal and move on. Excellent, thank you, Monica. And, and Senor? Um, I tried, I wonder your question if there's one answer because I think all the, uh, all the lines are right. And it depends on the context and situation, the age of the children, the, the violence uh, that, uh, that done and so on. And so very com complex to decide it. But I think we should understand that all what we um, observe is, is part of human being. And we try to deny that these uh, parts of human being are also, this, the specialic uh, parts are also a part of our human being. And it's better to recognize that not everything is good and well, if, even of social workers like uh, and uh, work for this heart and for the rights, to recognize this and to look at the reality and to look at its conflict. And they are different for the individual child and another answer for the society or the form family or the for, for the whole state. So I would say there are different parts for different um, target groups and systems. Exactly, that's, that's, that's very interesting. You, you, you're right, context uh, matters. And, and, and of course, presumably in your research as well and, and in our research in Cyprus or Colombia, we've seen the victims of, of crimes, of war crimes, very often are the ones who say blood for blood is not the answer. Let's move on. Let's find uh, different response. So it's very, very interesting. It's counterintuitive sometimes, but this is what uh, research suggests. I have a question for Raj. Um, there's a question from Erika here, who is and it's a question actually very close to my heart as well. Um, over the last decade, um, IFSW has created an Indigenous Commission and a human rights focus, again, includes Indigenous voices. Barika asks, are we doing enough, actually, to, to meaningfully, I add, uh, include Indigenous knowledge um, and, and Indigenous communities as experts, not just um, sources, uh, Erika says. Uh, when we talk about decolonization, we need the, the actual involvement of people. Are we doing enough as a global profession? My simple response will be no. And this has, you know, I have seen again and again, every single day. Um, the, the part of the world, you know, where I'm, you know, uh, living at the moment in Australia is one of the you know, places, you know, where we have this debate, you know, a debate about, you know, indigenous people and Aboriginal population, you know, every single day, in every single, you know, workshop and seminars, in policy, in politics, in economics, in sustainable development everywhere. But what is happening from my personal perspective is, it's a kind of a tokenistic kind of approach, you know, where people, they are giving you know, sentiments, those who have power to make decisions, those who, who can influence the decision-making process. They are giving you know, some sort of you know, sentiment that indigenous voices and Aboriginal voices are being included. But in reality, it has not been included, you know. And this is where you know, we need to have you know, more research. We need to engage in um, dialogue with you know, indigenous population and you know, uh, other you know, indigenous population in you know, other part of the world and, you know, see the way how best we can capture their voices, how best you know, we can include their ideas in our you know, mainstream society, whether it's, it's about you know, policy, it's about you know, politics, or you know, sustainable development, you know, whatever is there. Just you know, saying you know, we're making, their, making them to be included in the process is not sufficient. Now it's time for us to act, not just you know, talk you know, and have, you know, uh, empty, you know, or, or just creating you know, rhetoric and discourses. We don't need any more rhetoric and discourses. You know, what we need at the moment is some sort of, you know, action. And this action has to be taken at the different levels of social work institutions, institutes and associations. Beginning from, you know, a local organization, local, you know, association or national association to, you know, um, 
uh, regional association and you know uh, international association, including you know international federation of social workers or, uh, or other you know uh, international body of social work and local associations. Associations they need to have meaningful discussion and they need to engage in meaningful you know, action there. That is a very powerful point to which to wrap up. I'm sure that both the panelists and presenters and um, everyone who is present here would love a chance to discuss this far more. And we really hope that on the back of this seminar series, we create more opportunities for our exchange and for further action. Um, for now, I really wish to thank all of our presenters for their uh, powerful presentations today, which again stimulated a lot of responses and, and echoed um, other people's experiences from across the globe. Thank you all so much. Um, for everyone um, who takes part, thank you for attending today. The seminar, while it's not in your calendars, please do make sure to come back for the final session next, Friday, uh, next Tuesday. I do apologize on the 3rd of May, starting again at 5.30. UK uh, British Standard uh, Time on international organizations, global partnerships and social contribution to sustainable peace. Um, we have two presenters for the final presentation and as always I'm just putting in the chat our uh, uh, brief evaluation which really helps us to capture what your key learning is and how to make this seminar series better. For now I wish you all uh, very, uh, going back to sleep well if uh, for some of our colleagues uh, and uh, uh, lovely and restful evening for the rest of us. Um, um, thank you all so much, and um, I look forward to seeing you all uh, next week too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And be